Dan Bryant, uh, and I serve as the executive director of uh, Square One Villages uh, here in Eugene. I'm particularly uh, delighted to be here to share um, something that is very close to my heart and uh, for which I have a, a deep passion. So uh, I'm also a pastor of a downtown church, First Christian Church in Eugene, that has had significant involvement with the uh, homeless um, in over the last oh, 50 plus years. Uh, the church began a, um, a clothing ministry in the 50s. That was just a little before my time. Um, and then uh, are involved in what's called the Interfaith Family Shelter that provides uh, emergency shelter for families. It started the year that I came to Eugene in 1991. And they told me, this is just temporary until we fix this problem that we're having, right? Here we are 27 years later, we're still doing it. Though St. Vincent de Paul that runs that had just recently purchased a building that they're gonna use for that program. And then in 1997, we became one of the first sites for what's known as the car camping program here in Eugene that provides very basic shelter in RVs and little wagons we call uh, Conestoga huts. Uh, we've served uh, over 120 individuals in the last 20 years uh, through that program. And we're one of the sites for the Egan Warming Center. So most people in Eugene uh, know this, but tonight, as a matter of fact, the Egan Warming Center will be open, will provide emergency shelter for typically 250 to 300 individuals who have no other place to sleep. Uh, literally is a life-saving uh, effort to get people out from under the cold. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, uh, about seven, eight years ago, we started a free breakfast on Sunday morning, serve about 250 uh, people uh, every Sunday. All told, we have about 20,000 touches uh, with folk that are homeless uh, uh, throughout the year. And um, I decided that uh, I needed to do something to go upstream uh, from this his old historic church and begin to find ways to address the issue uh, at its root and uh, to deal with homelessness. And as Tom said, since I am a preacher and like to share the good news, I have to have a text. So my text uh, for this is uh, from the Gospel of Oz. There is no place like home, there is no place like home, there is no place like home, right? Um, nobody has magically been transferred to Kansas, so I guess you forgot to click your heels. Um, but home, of course, is you know, that place that is so important to us. And from the earliest of times to the present, we have made our homes as ever best we can with whatever materials we have on hand in every continent uh, of this earth, uh, a place to be, a place where we could seek safety from the uh, environment, a place to keep our belongings and to raise our families, to make our livings. Uh, from the lowlands uh, to the highlands, uh, we have made our home wherever best we can, uh, from uh, that idyllic place on a Greek island to that idyllic place in the countryside with a great view of the mountains, through the door, through the roof, through the ceiling, you know, my ideal home. Um, your home is your castle, we like to say. The Roman philosopher wrote, what more sacred, what more strongly guarded by every holy feeling than one's own home. And so we do our best wherever we can, but for so many of our citizens, um, home is unachievable and they're forced to survive however best they can with whatever um, they have at hand. Uh, and I feel very strongly that homelessness is the social justice issue of our time. It is perhaps the greatest injustice uh, that we see today since Martin Luther King and friends walked across that uh, Selma Bridge uh, nearly 50 years ago. So imagine what it's like to be homeless, to have no place to bathe, to cook, to keep your clothes, uh, no place when you're ill, uh, no place uh, where you keep your belongings. Uh, there's often a stigma and a shame that comes with being homeless, but in my mind, the greatest shame is that we have made it nearly impossible for the poorest of the poor to live with any dignity among us. Meanwhile, instead of providing shelter, we do things like we put boulders under bridges um, and we build fencing uh, to keep people out of those places where they might seek to uh, find shelter. Uh, so where do we think they're going to go? Uh, because people have to go somewhere, right? Every person has to have a place to be. Here in this community, we have uh, one bed for about every four people who are on the street. 
uh, we have, in fact, the highest rate of unsheltered homeless anywhere in the country outside of California, Florida, Georgia, and Hawaii. Um, so think about the environment here as opposed to those places and how difficult it is to survive. Homelessness is not just a problem for the unhoused, it has an impact on all of us. So consider that more than a third of those who are living on the streets are there because of, men of a mental health issue. Does anyone blame the mentally ill uh, for a condition um, that either came as a result of life or which, uh, which they were born with? Um, the county jails in most communities, including this one, is the number one provider of mental health services. Um, I consider that not to be an indictment on the mentally ill, that's an indictment on society, that we have not done a better job providing those mental health services and as a result they end up in our jails. Drug and alcohol issues, I think we have to be honest, that is a serious problem among many who are homeless, but again, the medical community has long recognized addiction is a medical issue. And I, from my experience, many people who did not have an addiction or a mental illness when they became homeless developed one uh, after they became homeless because it's a means of, of self-medicating. Uh, so why do we expect uh, addicts to suddenly, you know, uh, cure themselves of their addiction before we will provide them shelter? Uh, and then there are those who are neither addicts nor mentally ill who are simply homeless because of their poverty, low skills, low paying jobs. Um, and from my experience in working in that downtown church, I estimate roughly about a third of those who are on the streets are those that I call economic refugees of our society who just have uh, no place else to live. And we know from statistics uh, that gathered by our federal government that one in four renters pay half of their income towards their housing. And if you know anything about that, anything over a third is considered to be unstable. Uh, and among those who earn the minimum wage, 70% pay half uh, of their income on their housing. We estimate over 11 million individuals who are at risk of becoming homeless simply because they do not have sufficient income. Over 1 million evictions every year simply for failure to pay rent. Uh, so I want to be clear that the problem is not homelessness. The problem is lack of good jobs, the problem is lack of services, the problem is dysfunctional families who do not have uh, adequate support. Uh, in other words, it's not their problem, it's our problem. And one of the ironies is that we know from a number of studies, such as one done in Central Florida of three counties, uh, that it actually costs more to leave someone on the street than it does to provide them shelter. And this one particular study, over 10,000 individuals uh, that they identified uh, that was costing them um, $31,000 a year uh, to provide the services in addition to things like, you know, when you're on the street, you end up uh, in the hospital more often. You end up encountering the police more often. You end up with all kinds of legal problems and being trespassed and court issues and so forth. $31,000 a year where they could provide housing and services for those same individuals at a rate of about $10,000 a year. Uh, and so for those who have no other place to go, the only choice is to strike out wherever best they can, often banding together with others who are on the street to form their own little communities. Well, so at square one, Villages, we decided to take advantage of that kind of communal nature among the homeless and create an intentional community. Uh, I like to say it's a gated community for the homeless uh, that we call Opportunity Village. The rich get gated communities, why shouldn't the poor have them as well? Um, and indeed, if you go onto the property, uh, you will be challenged by someone who's at the front gate uh, and uh, asks why you're there and you have to sign in and you just can't go there and hang out. Uh, we call the nonprofit Square One because it's helping people to begin at Square One. Uh, we opened uh, this program, Transitional Shelter Program, uh, in August of 2013, started with 14 individuals, built it up over nine months um, to its uh, current capacity of about uh, typically 35 individuals. Andrew Heben, who is kind of the architect of the, much of the concept, and has literally written the book on it called Tent City Urbanism, available at, at uh, Amazon, was gonna be here today. Unfortunately, he was ill and can't uh, join us. 
Uh, but that project began with those 14 people and a lot of volunteers uh, that we built over that period of nine months and it's become a nice little community um, where I say is about 32 to 35 people are living. We've helped over 150 people since we opened in 2013. Average stay is about nine to 15 months, though some individuals have been there for two to three years. Uh, in some cases, it just takes a long time to get them sheltered. Um, there are 29 units and uh, it cost us a little over $200,000, but actually less than $100,000 in cash to build. Uh, the rest came in in-kind donations. It uh, cost us about $1,200 a month to operate. That's about $5 a night per person, and the villagers pay $35 a month to help cover some of those costs, uh, about a fifth of the operating cost. So on it, it costs us about $4 net per person. We think it's probably one of, if not the most cost-effective shelter in the nation. Uh, all villagers are required to participate in a weekly meeting where all division uh, decisions are reviewed and made. All kinds of good things have happened. People have gotten jobs, people have gotten back into school, people have graduated from college even, uh, and I've even done two weddings. One of the benefits of being an a ordained minister, uh, villagers that got married uh, there in the village. So lots of good things happened. We did this program as a pilot project uh, commissioned from the city of Eugene and the city commissioned a group here at the University of Oregon to do a study of how effective we are, and they found that 90% uh, of our neighbors approved of what we were doing. And they discovered the residents themselves uh, rated it very highly, uh, felt that it was helping them in their own uh, efforts to become self-sufficient, uh, and they recommended that the program be continued, and now it's been renewed by our city council twice. Uh, so one of the biggest problems we found was helping people to transition out, to find affordable housing. Uh, a number of our villagers have income, have jobs, in some cases full-time jobs, but can't afford to find a place to live. Um, for our first two years, Section 8 wasn't even open. We've only had a handful of villagers since who've uh, got housing through Section 8. Um, and when you look at our local housing authority of why it's so difficult, you can quickly see why on their um, website, uh, Homes for Good website, used to be called HACSA, they list the wait times. And for someone listening, looking for a three-bedroom apartment, the wait time is about one year. For smaller and bigger families, the wait time is two to, four, two to three years. But if you only need a single bedroom or a studio, the smallest, most affordable housing possible, the wait time when I made this slide was five years. It's now over six years. Uh, when I last checked, they were processing applications they received in September 2011. Um, so why is that? Well, simply put, the housing is too expensive uh, to build. Um, I love this story because I was up roofing uh, one of the units there at, at uh, Opportunity Village with all the experience uh, training I have as a minister and how to roof. Uh, one of our villagers thought I could use a little help and indeed he got up on the roof and uh, things went a lot quicker for some reason when I got off. Uh, it turned out he was a professional roofer, but he's now on, uh, on oxygen 24-7, has COPD. Um, likely he doesn't have five or six years to live. Um, and he's one of our villagers who uh, were working desperately to get into permanent housing by building a new style of housing. So when you look at affordable housing, it costs an average $150,000 to $200,000 to build per unit. And a case in point, wonderful project here in Eugene called Bascom Village, $169,000 per unit. But in Eugene, we have, we know, on average, 700 chronically homeless individuals. Um, homeless for over a year with another presenting condition. And if we just tried to house them two per unit, got those units down to bare necessities of $125,000 each, it would cost us $44 million. We are never going to see that kind of money in this community, probably anywhere else, um, because it's just not available. And that's not counting that some 10,000 people we know that become situationally homeless at some point during the year. So how do we address this problem? We believe we need to come up with a new solution of truly affordable housing, and we are building such a project called Emerald Village, building tiny homes that are very attractive. Um, and uh, we've teamed up with a group of 13 builders and architects who've designed us very cute, uh, very efficient buildings of 160 to 280 square feet. Uh, simple designs to maximize use of volunteers in, in uh, building them to keep the labor costs down. Um, 
and the villagers themselves are required to put in 50 hours of sweat, sweat equity uh, in the building of their own homes. And these architects, these builders, are not only designing and building these homes. Uh, in those 13 cases, they're actually donating the homes to us. The challenge we gave to us was build us something for $25,000, and that's what they're doing. Uh, we purchased the land, we paid for the foundations, and then they're doing everything uh, from there on up. The residents pay $250 to $350 a month. Any students here at the university paying less than $350 a month for your housing? I didn't think so, right? Um, because our goal is to enable someone whose only income is disability or social security, and they might only have $750 in income, to enable them to pay their own way, to have the dignity to do that. Two of our units are fully ADA accessible. Uh, the village will have a common facility with full kitchen and the like, uh, but these are full legitimate dwelling units with heat, little kitchenettes, um, place for your bed, place to sit and eat and the like. We purchased our property two years ago, held our groundbreaking with some of the residents who had been chosen for the project uh, and our mayor that participated in that. And then this past summer began construction. Um, 22 tiny homes of which 18 are now in various states, or 19 I think are now in various states. We got one more, it's gonna be moved tomorrow, right Alex? Wow. Alex Daniel over here is and Tom are the uh, architects of that house that's already been built and will be moved and set on its uh, foundation tomorrow. Um, and uh, it's a 1.7 million dollar project. We've got just uh, 150,000 dollars left to raise. Uh, about a half a million of that comes from in-kind contributions. Um, the villagers, the unique thing about this project, these villagers are not just renters, they are actually members of a co-op that leases the facility and their membership stake is worth $1,500. They're paying that off $50 a month. Uh, so after 30 months, that $50 payment goes away and now their rent's even cheaper. But the point is, is they have that pride and as well as the benefit and that sense of that they are at least a part homeowner uh, in their own home. We moved our first uh, folk uh, into the village uh, here just before Christmas. Uh, Gib here and Sadie uh, moved in and he was living in an old beat up RV before he moved into this beautiful little home um, here just a month and a half ago. Purchased an acre of property in Cottage Grove uh, south of here where we hope to start another project this year of th 13 tiny homes. Um, so our desire is uh, you know, to help uh, people uh, create a miniature form of the American dream. That's why I chose this picture, um, so that they can have a home of our own. At our website, squareonevillages.org, uh, you find there a toolbox that has a, a lot of the uh, tools that we have created in this process. Um, and you can find there a 10-step process for creating your own village and including some models of other communities similar to ours, case, case studies. So at Square One Villages, we believe just because someone is poor, that doesn't mean they should have poor or no housing. Our goal is to enable many of our citizens who live with very minimal incomes to live affordably with the pride of their own home. Um, so that the residents of our projects will have that pride, that benefit, and most importantly, um, uh, the responsibility of having their own home until we provide safe, efficient, attractive, affordable housing for all of the members of our community who desire and deserve a place to call home. And it all begins at square one. So that's that for that. I'm gonna let Tom talk about some of the challenges, the legal challenges. Thank you. Well, there's a lot of, um, a lot of different approaches to this um, and a lot of different reasons to uh, uh, deal with housing. And uh, I am very interested in the homeless housing aspect of it, but it's by no means the only. And so, um, like I said, different reasons. Uh, I would say that uh, probably my priority in dealing with this has to do with environmental reasons. Uh, so the homeless situation is definitely for, there for me, but resource conservation is a big part of it. Uh, a lot of people, just it fits, small housing fits. Uh, 
There's uh, elements of freedom from uh, uh, unnecessary possessions, which uh, bring people down to voluntary simplicity type of uh, choices. Uh, affordability is a very big one for a lot of people. Understanding that uh, we spend uh, the general uh, population, somewhere between one quarter and one half of income is spent on housing. Uh, and uh, resetting cultural norms is a very big one for me. I do a lot of work in climate change. And uh, one of the reasons that I like to show this is that uh, we have a two, per, two degree uh, hold target on this and to achieve this uh, these are the uh, uh, current in 2010 you can see the uh, emissions per capita on the world are about 7.3 we're projecting that we need to get that down to approximately two uh, one, one to four really is the whole science uh, and uh, in the United States though we're up somewhere between 15 and 25 tons per capita <coughs> We need to be in this uh, target range here, and uh, considering that uh, uh, to get there, we're going to have to be on, uh, there's three different downward curves from where that, uh, those three lines diverge downward. That's about where we are, and the science is right now projecting that we're going to be dropping for a little while. We're, we're coming up right at this moment. Uh, they think that we're going to drop down and then we're going to start curving up, business as usual. And we need to be on one of these three curves. Each one of those three curves has its own rationale. Our children's trust is the one that's the steepest one. Uh, there's the state of Oregon's curve, which is that straight one, the little higher downward curve. Uh, but uh, overall, uh, one of the reasons that this is uh, happening is that uh, housing represents a significant portion. About a third of our emissions come from housing. I think I have a slide on that. But, uh, this is how we feel. This is an opinion research uh, question, giving a choice of A or B. Climate change requires us to change our way of life, such as driving less or living more simply. Or if climate change becomes a problem, we can deal with it later. Uh, this is or a survey that we worked on in 2013. The results are hanging just about steady right now, uh, through, uh, all the way through, still remaining the same. In this, the, the state of Oregon on the left-hand side, the bar uh, graph, and then it shows five different segments of Oregon, which dispels the myth to some extent that once you get to the eastern side of the state, that it's going to be a very conservative and it's going to flip. It doesn't really. Overall, Oregonians and even across the nation, we've tested this national, nationally pretty close to the same results, pretty stable across time. Uh, this is the point that uh, on uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, an average 2,400 square foot home has a life cycle carbon emission of about 7.4 tons of CO2 equivalencies per year over a 50 year life expectancy. That's about a third of, what our, of our current and about three times what we need to be at. So it's one of those components that we're going to have to bring into the equation if we're going to uh, deal with this, uh, this being the average looking type of house. Uh, one of the challenges that we face is that as a cultural norm, our house sizes are getting bigger while the population within the house gets smaller. In 1952, we were at 292 square foot per, per person. Right now, the, uh, uh, this is uh, in 2015, it was uh, 1,059. In uh, 2018, that's up about another 20% on average. We are going in the wrong direction. And that's what interests me so much about small houses and changing the, the cultural norm about what is acceptable to make uh, high quality, durable, long lasting, attractive, livable houses that are uh, considerably smaller than we are. Uh, one of the as aspects about uh, as an environmental law conference, and I'm, I've been attending some of the uh, panels a lot of issues around forestry, about biodiversity, around ecological stability, around climate change. And 24% of all wood products consumed in the country are for residential construction. That's a huge figure yielding the kind of landscape uh, uh, and land use that you see in the lower picture. So uh, getting right to the subject though, I wanted to do a quick overview from a book called The Tiny House Book published in 19. 87, and for the life of me, I don't know why I credited the author of the, or the, uh, uh, the editor and the author of the book, but uh, 
uh, and I, I don't have it, didn't make it into the slide, but I want to hit this Thomas Jefferson house first. This is 200 square feet. Uh, he lived in it with his new bride uh, for five years while he was building Monticello. 200 square foot, 200, two story. Uh, you can see the characterization of the stairway in there, which I'm going to talk a little bit about coming up in a few minutes. And that's the picture of it standing today. All three of these houses are standing today. This is, 17, this is 18th century. Next one's going to be a 19th century, a frontier cabin. Uh, it's uh, 224 square feet, had a sleeping loft, uh, uh, still standing, still in use, uh, uh, really quite remarkable, a uh, couple hundred years old. The next one is uh, built in 1906 during the San Francisco earthquake. Uh, these are called earthquake refugee shacks that they built. They built about 7,000 of them in mass production, distributed them around the city for, uh, for residences, and there are still 600 in San Francisco that are standing. And this is one of them. You can see a big, big building in the background. And uh, the point of this, from this book, he has about 50 examples of houses which uh, contain these types of details that are uh, kind of these uh, floor plans. He has scale drawings that can be blown up. They're all scalable and measurable. They're all excellent examples of, for anybody that wants to how-to it or just look at examples. I just recommend the book as kind of an inspiration. What's the name of the book? Uh, it's The Tiny House Book, 1987. And uh, I'll, I'll give you my email address. All you have to do is send me a, a question, and I'll send you the author's <laughs> name and the link to get the book. It's uh, not published, but I bought a couple of copies for a fraction of the new price. So they're, they're out there and available. Uh, this is a house that uh, I participated in building. A friend of mine lived here for eight years on a commune in, uh, uh, in the uh, early 70s. I had a house there. I can't find the picture of the house that I lived in, very similar to this. Uh, these are one room. Uh, we had a common kitchen, kind of like uh, Emerald uh, Opportunity Village. We had a common kitchen, a common library, a common barn, a common garden, and we lived in these houses. These are essentially bedrooms. Uh, this is a house that I uh, bought in downtown Eugene, my first house that I bought. Uh, it's a, uh, a small house over on 25th Street. I paid $16,000 for it and worked on it from that point. Houses were differently priced then, but it was bottom of the barrel, and it was a two-bedroom, small two-bedroom, 1924 house. Uh, and uh, that house still exists, uh, and it uh, represents that kind of earlier house where a family of four or five were living in a house that might be 600 square feet in size, the size of that house. <coughs> this is my present house, uh, its footprint. The assessor says it's uh, 16 by 24. He doesn't count the uh, rooms in the basement or the little uh, attic rooms up above. Uh, and uh, uh, I have found, uh, now that my uh, two kids have left home, uh, it's about twice as big as it needs to be for me and my wife. And this is just kind of getting into the uh, Emerald, Village uh, 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 Emerald Village construction, which uh, I'm uh, just sort of a consultant and I stop in occasionally and uh, help out or move a house tomorrow morning and things like that. But really on the outer edge, there's just a lot of cooperative work going on here to make this happen. A lot of members of the community uh, it's just one component. Uh, last week, the uh, Register Guard had a major commentary, front uh, page commentary, resolved to deliver housing solutions. Uh, we're working on this in the community, and that sets me up for the problem. The problem is we want to maximize the utility space, and this boils down to sleeping lofts. Imagine that you could increase the, uh, the size of your house by 50%, and it's going to cost you about 1 or 2 percent more. And that's putting a sleeping loft into an existing house. Uh, it's, it's legal in boats, it's legal in RVs, and it isn't legal in houses, in houses that are permanent, approved by your building codes official. And so uh, we decided the solution was to change the building codes, so we approached the building codes uh, division, and they <coughs> turned out that they're very prejudiced against small houses. And uh, they said it's a non-starter for them to entertain the idea of ladders and lofts. So along comes uh, the national effort to uh, address this at the time that we're working on it in the state. And the nationals 
Uh, the uh, International Codes Council, which is what the state of Oregon uses as their model code, adopted an item called Appendix Q. And Appendix Q is specifically for houses that are under 400 square feet and legalizes lofts and <coughs> atypical access under a, the normal residential code where stairs to get up to the upstairs would occupy approximately 50% of the floor area of the houses that we are building. And obviously you don't need to do that. And then we have ceiling clearances issues. And Appendix Q by the ICC was passed by 20,000 20, voting members by a three-quarter majority, over a three-quarter majority. That's their requirement. And they passed this Appendix Q. And the problem that we get to, so it's a problem, solution, problem, solution, problem, solution uh, matrix here, that the Building Codes Division of Oregon condemns Appendix Q as an illegitimate process, which is really remarkably outrageous in my personal opinion. Uh, so uh, going to my representative, I said, uh, Phil, we have a problem here, and what do you think we should do? And he says, well, I'll get their attention. We'll tell them that the legislature wants to deal with this. So we'll do a bill, and we'll, uh, by statutory uh, approach, adopt Appendix Q, and they'll come to the table, and we'll negotiate through that, and we'll get it done that way. And so we did that, and it uh, passed the House, uh, 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 a 43 to 16 bipartisan, notwithstanding that the Buildings Code's official, the, the, the administrator of Buildings Code, was actively involved lobbying against it in the legislature. Notwithstanding that active process by a reputable, uh, uh, credible individual actively working against it, we got the 43 to 16, but when it got to the Senate and it went into the Senate committee, uh, my senator, unfortunately, I'm uh, 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 displeased to report that he's my senator, decided that uh, it would be in wisdom to revert that uh, by negotiation back to building codes agency and let them pass it by Oregon administrative rule, which there's a certain inherent logic in that. And so uh, the Senate amended the bill to, re to remand it to uh, adopt Appendix Q, sent it back to the building codes official. I told my senator that that was not a good idea, but he thought that that was the right way, given that this is the Oregon way to do it, to have to not do things statutorily when they should be done administratively. And it went back to the building codes official and he worked it hard through the process, uh, quite nefariously in my opinion. Not very good public uh, 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 process. Uh, worked it right up to the deadline, giving us one month after he basically uh, uh, eviscerated the policy. He did do Appendix Q, but he added a set of components that made it virtually impossible to do that. And so I'm, uh, once again, uh, must have idled too long on that. So um, I think this got a little out of position and I didn't save it, but Oregon law, statutory law, and I'm going to go down to this red part, but this is the, this is the section in the findings that authorizes the building codes agency to begin its work and do its job. And I ha the, all of the underlined parts are as quick and as efficiently as practical, flexible and responsive, flexible responsive system. And it, the one that I, I found most interesting is, it is in the best interest of this state that the building code regulations encourage economic development, experimentation, innovation, cost effectiveness, and construction. And that's the statutory law, and what we're dealing with at administrative law is an agency who is opposed to small houses, prejudicially, in my opinion. And so we find ourselves uh, uh, coming up against this. Uh, this is Appendix Q, and I'm just kind of uh, going to kind of skip over this pretty quickly. I, I kind of touched on it earlier, uh, and I think that's all uh, what I've, I've already repeated uh, and, uh, and, I, and I have already said this, the legislature did pass in 2017, kind of gave you that story. And uh, the Building Codes Agency, in their rulemaking, did these things in addition to Appendix Q. They required fire sprinklers throughout the dwelling. 
That's not included in the residential single family code. So they're adding something that we are not required to have in our houses. Uh, they set a minimum loft size area ratio to the room that it enters into. And the buildings that we're building at, er at Emerald would not qualify. It's sort of like a man maximum minimum that when you do this, they cross over each other and it excludes the ability to actually use the lofts. It's an amazing trick that, it, uh, that they went through the, and, and the, uh, the ratio part of it is entirely illogical in my opinion and not in the uh, model code from the uh, International Codes Council. Uh, fire resistive materials throughout the dwelling. In other words, make it so that the entire interior has no wood trim, has no accents. Uh, it's all going to be sheetrock, metal corners, uh, hospital uh, kind of grade, uh, uh, maybe like a paint, uh, a paint room where you might have a fire, a fire resistive material in this house uh, with the assumption that the people that live in these buildings are going to be having large fuel loads that they're going to be lighting off and we have to protect them from themselves. Uh, it includes not more than one loft so that if you had a uh, like a 400 square foot house with a loft for an adult and a loft for a child uh, 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 set from each other that would be prohibited. Uh, kitchen appliances setbacks from the loft I'm not really personally too concerned about that I don't oppose that I can see uh, some elements, but that's not in Appendix Q. And additional uh, dimension clearance requirements that are also not in Appendix Q. You take that all together, and it pretty much puts a nix on many applications in very small houses. So uh, we're back to the uh, legislature in 2018, which uh, right at this moment may have already adjourned as of today. I heard that they were thinking of adjourning. Uh, it, uh, I heard uh, by email yesterday that uh, our uh, 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 tr trial to get it back into the legislature to remand to the building codes agency or to override the building codes agency, uh, that is dead for this year. Uh, so I'm not sure if I had this. Yeah, so this is sort of a, a it isn't much longer. It's just a little more official sounding. It has some uh, statutory language in it, numbers and references and things like that. But uh, we're proposing at this point uh, uh, for, a, uh, for a law that any jurisdiction in Oregon which has a building official may adopt Appendix Q of the 2018 ICC Residential Code by local or ordinance and then we'd have it sunset in about five years when the next one comes up. That'll give us some breathing room. It allows us to loft into the uh, Emerald Village. It allows us to get things done. And it also allows us to demonstrate that these things are safe. And I actually, my personal view from the Building Codes Administrator's uh, position is that he's prejudiced for reasons that don't have anything to do with safety. Uh, we, he said in the hearings that we worked on, work sessions, uh, he, he declared that, uh, that uh, he objected to tiny houses because it creates second class citizens and that, uh, and that they, and creating slums. And uh, we're, we uh, find ourselves in opposition to that viewpoint because we think that we're building very high quality houses like the San, San Francisco earthquake homes. 600 of them still exist, you know, a, a, more than a century later. These houses like Thomas Jefferson's, there's nothing about small houses that imply to me that they're slums. And so I just have a real beef with this guy and my legislators know how I feel, so they probably see me as, uh, as I see him, prejudiced. Uh, I do uh, uh, opinion research, and so in a survey that we ran in uh, uh, November, December, we asked this, that was question 32, an A-B choice. Uh, this is a group of 11, uh, 1,100 citizens in Oregon, Colorado, and Washington, of which 518 were from Oregon. That's a long story why we did it that way, but just looking at the Oregon ones, homeless housing, which do you agree with uh, more? Uh, building codes which discourage tiny homes should be reformed, 78%. Tiny homes promote second-class citizens and slums, 
That's taking the words right out of the building official's mouth. Uh, we just like to uh, state it the way opposition states it and see how where the public lands on this. And so uh, that gives us a pretty good idea that the public's on our side. Uh, we know what we're working for. Uh, and uh, that's the close. Thank you very much.